Get more confidence. Get that promotion. Get moving up the corporate ladder. Get a better gig with an MBA from Mays Business School at Texas A&M University. Whether you're starting out or stepping up, now you can take your career to a whole new level with a full-time MBA in College Station and convenient weekend options at Houston City Center. Texas A&M has a program to suit your schedule. Visit mba.tamu.edu. And Giga Maggie. Howdy, welcome to Maze Mastercast. I'm Shannon Deer, the Assistant Dean for Graduate Programs, here with your remarkable host, Ben Wiggins. Good morning, Shannon. How are you today? I'm good. My voice almost cracked when I said Ben Wiggins, but since I'm not a 12-year-old boy, I resisted that. So, Ben Wiggins. Glad that worked out for you. It did. It did. How are you? It's a beautiful day in Aggieland. It is a beautiful day in Aggieland. It's good to be here. It is. It's great to be here. How was your weekend? My weekend was pretty nice, pretty low key. Not a whole lot to report, really. Brielle is growing like a weed. They do that, apparently. And uh, how was your weekend? It was good. I wakeboarded, of course, because that's what I do like three times a week now. (laughs) COVID life life with no traveling means more wakeboarding. So that's fun. My hands are a little bloody, but it's good. (laughs) I've avoided major. Yeah, I've avoided the major injuries, but I've had some minor, minor kind of continual injuries. But it's been really good. It's been fun. And I'm becoming better friends with Maddie, your lovely wife. So that's been a fun part of this week. She is pretty cool. She's pretty cool. That woman is on fire right now. I just got to say how proud I am of her. That's really cool. Yeah. Yeah. She's great. I've enjoyed it a lot. I enjoy her. Yeah, so has she. She has her own episode. So y'all should listen to that that's been been released on Mastercast. She's amazing. But today we have Bridget Chambers on the show. Bridget is one of my favorite people. I really enjoy her. She says in part of the show, her greatest misconception is that she's not very chatty. And I can totally relate. She's no nonsense, get the business done, wanting those you know deeper conversations that in involves some productivity. And I really appreciate that about Bridget. But she's also very, very thoughtful and kind. And I've seen her in many conversations really provide that deep wisdom that no one else gets to. And that's what I appreciate most about Bridget. She is an American Business Association award-winning executive, turnaround expert, growth strategist, educator, and successful business author. She has two amazing books, one that she wrote with Lisa Leslie, who is a four-time gold medalist in the Olympics and Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame member. Uh, Lisa Leslie is certainly someone who I got to watch as a hero and really awesome that Bridget partnered with her on a book. That book is called From the Court to the Boardroom. It was published in 2017. Bridget's other book is Profitable Problem Solving, and you can find both of those bestsellers on Amazon. Bridget is now a faculty member at Texas A&M. She's also a graduate from our executive MBA program, so she is a proud Aggie in multiple regards. She's an executive professor with the management department here at Mays Business School, teaches lots of great courses in our EMBA program and in the management department and makes a really significant contribution here at Mays Business School. You'll hear her talk about coming back to Mays really because of finding her purpose. And it's great to have her contributing to that purpose here at Mays Business School. Bridget has been recognized more than a dozen times by the American Business Association, including receiving the award for Turnaround Executive of the Year, Maverick of the Year, and Female Executive of the Year. Bridget has really specialized in the area of turnaround. She's gone in with many companies and worked on turning them around. The insights that she's gained from that are incredibly valuable and something that we can all learn from. We hope you enjoy the episode. She picked a really cool superpower, too. She did. Super unusual, as I would expect. She did her research. Indeed. Enjoy. We welcome Dr. Bridget Chambers to the show. Thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited. Us too. Me too, in particular. How was, uh, how was your weekend? You know, it was nice. It was a little bit of fun. I uh, had the 
quarantine bubble over for, um, you know, for some swimming and some fun. And I've been working on the final uh, details for my new book that's coming out in October. So it was a little work and a little fun. We'll, uh, I definitely want to touch on that book momentarily. What is, for now, what is your favorite superpower? Yeah, you know, uh, I wanted to say time travel, but I think everybody says that. And that's simply because I'm a history buff. So, um, you know, that was kind of my thought behind that. Right. Well, I did a little research. Do you have any idea how many superpowers there are that you can choose from? I mean, yes, I'm a big comic book guy. All right. Well, I, I found a pretty cool one from DC. It's okay. um, order manipulation. Oh. So this is all about being able to control the orderly powers of the universe. Oh. And I thought, especially as a change agent, you know, since that never happens in the real world for me, I thought <laughs> that is the superpower for me. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to set time travel as my second favorite and go with go with order manipulation now i gotta now so it's gravity it's like weak electromagnetic strong electromagnetic so i understand if you're if you're a comic fan i understand that kismet is the dc character that has this power okay so um I, I'm not sure if that's a dark thing or a great thing but uh it looked like forces that could be used for good yeah and I can see how I could use that so yeah that is very cool. That's very cool. I'm gonna I'm gonna go nerd out on fundamental forces after we're done recording. That's what I had to do to figure it out. So we'll um, we'll be sharing that. Well, what a great answer! Thank you. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Austin. <laughs> yeah, How so many in your family? Five, three kids. My parents. What? Where were you in the birth order? The oldest. So if that syndrome is true, I think I put the explanation point on it. <laughs> <laughs> Same beer, actually. What was your first job? Entrepreneur, of course. I mean, not the typical lemonade stand thing, but when I was a kid in school, I um, my first my first business was this over the top candy operation, which I would regularly be in trouble for in school because you weren't supposed to bring it with you. Um, after that, this is going to show my age a little bit, but there was this really cool TV show called Dukes of Hazard. Oh yeah. Everybody loved the, you know, the General Lee. And so I was able to get a lot of uh, images of this photocopied and I sold them for a nickel. You know, I just, entrepreneur was kind of my thing, but my first job where I had to go sit for an interview and be hired, I was uh, a stalker at Kroger. Okay. Yeah. What, 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 what was that like? Any funny stories from that? No, oh, I got fired pretty quickly, actually. Why? Um, I had my hand in my pocket while I was, while I was stocking, and I think that didn't fit the, the rules. So it actually kind of left an imprint on me because I, I was one of those people who was, by that time, I was pretty good at the things I was doing. I did a lot of sports, and so I was... I liked accomplishments and I felt good about doing things and, and being good at them. And so it was kind of a humbling experience to, you know, to, to be terminated for something. So that kind of stuck with me. And actually I, I'm really glad for the experience now because l later in life, as I got into turnaround work, uh, yeah. you know, there's a lot of times where you have to let people go, not for performance based reasons, for reasons that were way beyond these fantastic performers control. And mm -hmm. so from a very early age, I understood the dignity that you needed to try to, you know, to put into that moment so that people could leave with, you know, with something positive, even though it was a very negative experience. And so I know it sounds silly to get that from your first job, but it, I, I'm glad for the experience. I have two questions. The first one is you got fired for having your hand in your pocket. A jacket pocket, yeah. You know, so you're supposed to be facing things and pulling them to the front of the shelf. Uh huh. Well, you you got to do that with quite an impressive pace at Kroger, or you get. Yeah. So I had, yeah. So instead of having two hands out, I had oh, one okay. pocket and the other. Yeah, that was. Did they give you a warning of any kind, or was it just like, no, hand in pocket, she's gone? You know, I'm going with the latter because that's how I remember it. But, uh, you know, I was 16, so yeah. who knows? Right. Maybe, maybe there was some kind of warning ahead of time. 
the the other thing that i the other thing that i was wondering about from what you just said was you were talking about having to let people go for reasons that had nothing to do with performance did i did i hear that right exactly is this a, was it a question of like right person wrong seat like jim collins gino wickman type of stuff no it's like um bad leadership decisions that lead to solvency issues and so uh, you know unfortunately the 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 hard truth is that when companies are trying to reestablish themselves the fastest way to cut expenses is usually to cut good people it's a, it's a short-term, you know, solution that, that doesn't often generate positive results, but um, it's, a, it's a pretty typical one. And so I would often, in turnaround scenarios, walk in and either be in the middle of, you know, first or second round, or I would have to institute those rounds. It's just gut-wrenching, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. Was, was the movie, was it Up in the Air with, oh, with George that. Clooney? Yeah. Yes, I've heard that many times because uh, my friends kind of tease me because of the I'm a point hound. I'm that person that has a, you know, loyalty account with every airline and hotel chain. I'm I've flown over four million miles. It's um, yeah, that I hear a lot about that movie. But the, the thing that that um, the main character did, you know, in terms of going in and turning around shops and letting people go was very similar to some of the outcomes of the turnarounds that I did, except that, you know, we usually tried to create a scenario where we were able to keep people. And we, you know, we really tried to make that a, a later option. It wasn't the first thing that we went to. Hmm. But sometimes it's, un, sometimes it's unavoidable. Yeah, definitely understand. So going back to the team building questions, what was, what was your greatest challenge as a child? <laughs> I was one of those kids that was probably in a little too much trouble. You know, I, I don't know if I just needed more structure or what, but growing up, um, it seemed to take a lot of extra efforts on the part of the adults around me. And, uh, but that was better by the time I was able to get involved in sports. Uh, mm. Sports was it was such a formative experience for me. I started competitive swimming at a very young age, um, seven maybe, and uh, and then from there I got involved in pretty much every other sport that um, that was available to me, and that made a big difference. That made a, a huge difference for me. The coaches, my teammates, my competitive nature. It, it just kind of helped me to be a kid that could have a purpose. You know. We have some things in common in that respect. I had a terribly difficult time sitting still in class, was just sort of always acting out, got into sports, and that helped a lot. Um, right, exactly. All the restless energy is an advantage in most sports. Yeah. Um, not swimming, though. I was never, never that good at swimming. Oh my God, I love swimming. Swimming's so cool because it's the, it, it's the epitome of individual sports, but at the same time, you can be part of a team, you know, both in the pool on a relay team, for example, or on the sidelines while you're, you know, cheering your teammates in. So for me, it worked, it worked really well. 60 seconds on your road to maze, if you would. <laughs> okay. So um, my road to maze, it was, it was really about purpose. Uh, I came back and got my MBA after um, selling a couple businesses and trying to establish myself both from a corporate perspective as well as an entrepreneur. And what I realized pretty quickly is uh, I was doing really well in the elements of the business that I understood. So the mm. functions that I grew up in, I had those down. But right. Uh, the rest of it, I didn't, I didn't really understand the impact of decisions to the whole enterprise. An MBA was the answer to that. Uh, and I only applied for one program. It was the EMBA program at Texas A&M. Mm. Uh, Julie Orzabal teases me today that I was the first person that, um, that interviewed for that particular class. And uh. I have to tell you, it was transformative for me. I loved it. And it, it, it really, I think, um, brought something out of me, both as a performer and as a learner. And uh, it's what put me on the path for my PhD, and it's what brought me back to Mays later. Hmm. Love that. Why a PhD at that point in your life? So I, I have to tell you, especially on the other side of the NBA, my career was on fire uh, and still continues from an industry perspective to be rather busy. Uh, it's lucrative. It's exciting. It's challenging. 
but I woke up somewhere in, I don't know, 2013, 2014, and I found myself happy professionally and financially, but I found myself feeling like I wasn't very purposeful. You know, I didn't make anything important. I wasn't carrying anything. I wasn't, I didn't feel like I was making big contributions. And yet I was so aware that I was reaping big rewards. And to me, somewhere that just became so incongruent that I needed to do something about it. And, but what do you do? You know, how do you just shift gears like that? You, you can only use the gifts that you have, right? You can't just turn into Mother Teresa overnight. And so- um, That's what you think. <laughs> Well, I, I'm probably not able to do that overnight. I, me neither. Me neither. That, that seems very difficult. I'm... Well, but I think everybody's got, I hope for everyone anyway, that they have that moment where they realize that it's not just a saying to wish the world a better place, you know, yeah. based on your own activities than, than the way that you found it. And so I, I needed to do something else. And I, I was cleaning up failure. So at some point I realized maybe instead of cleaning it up, I could prevent it. And, mm -hmm. and so I started working on ways to help companies avoid failure altogether. And that was a pivot in terms of the way that I was working with organizations, the way that I was working with subject matter experts. Uh, and then ultimately the opportunity at Mays to come in and teach just seemed so fitting. And the reason that I say so transformative is because it didn't just it didn't just finish the sentence for me in terms of a, a way to think about Bridget being purposeful. I I had no idea that the big passion in my life was really teaching, quite honestly. I mean, mm. I have to tell you, I I love a good boardroom brawl and I I love getting things done that seem like they're um, they're impossible, but there's nothing better than being in that classroom and answering questions about how somebody can make a difference from a diversity inclusion perspective, from a change perspective, from an organizational behavior perspective, and, and shaping the mindsets that are going to go out there and impact the rest of the world. I mean, I just find that absolutely thrilling every single day. So for me, Mays not only transformed my ability to perform, but it gave me a new way and a new home to do that. I've been told you could teach with an MBA in certain environments, mm. and, but you know I didn't want to do it that way. I I, I wanted to I, I wanted to move forward with some of these achievements as um, as a student, and I found a I found a real thrill in understanding underserved areas, um, both in terms of literature and in terms of practice. And the PhD for me was an opportunity to try to bridge some of those experiences. Talk a little bit more about underserved areas. Which ones did you gravitate to? Well, first I focused on failure because that's, that's pretty close to what I, what I was doing as a practitioner. Um, mm -hmm. But when you're thinking about avoiding failure, you're very quickly talking about organizational learning. And so I spent a lot of time focusing on how organizational learning can impact the rate or the cost of failure within an organization hmm. and the difference in tacit learning versus formal learning and how you can, you know, move ideas and process and knowledge through an organization. Uh, I believe that some organizations do it really well and they learn to avoid the failures that they've experienced now, they still have other failures ahead of them, but they've reserved all this great energy and resources to address those failures. These are companies like Google, like Apple. Uh, and then you've got other companies that uh, they, in, they also work on learning how to deal with failure, but what they instead do is they optimize failure. So they learn to fail less expensively. You know, they, they, they do it in a way where they're trying to minimize how many people they're laying off. And that's not the same game as avoiding failure altogether. And so I really tried to dig into that area and, and differentiate what distinguishes a company that fails less expensively over and over again versus a company that avoids failure and reserves those resources for new challenges. And to which, me, that's, that's fascinating. Which approach do you like more at this point? Oh, the latter, for sure. Absolutely. I, I think learning what caused an issue 
and creating a process internally to learn from that is uh, it, it makes your organization truly agile. You're you know, learning in an iterative way. You're practicing new behaviors and mindsets literally uh, on the heels of having potentially a difficult experience. And that moves the organization forward. That's where we find innovative experiences and that's where we find growth and competitiveness. But when you're constantly just trying to rethink how to do something less expensively, it's a closed loop. You know, mm-hmm. it's hard to get out of that. Hmm. Interesting. You authored two books, Profitable Problem Solving and From the Court to the Boardroom. The description of Court to Boardroom states, readers quickly learn how to reignite, love that word, the powerful foundation of strength formed while playing competitive sports and parlay, like that word too, those life-changing, high-performing behaviors into success in the business world. Let's get really specific. What is the most important single nugget, the most important core truth for readers to learn from this book? Uh, There's a very real connection between competitive and organized sports and business. And dependent on that fact is the fact that if you were able to be successful in sports, you're able to be successful in business. So it really is about taking those experiences, those practices, that mindset that made you a good team player, a good performer, and pivoting those into a business environment. Love hearing that. I interned for Enterprise in 2002 as a student at Rice, and they said they, at that point, they were basically just recruiting athletes. Um, they said it's that that works with our mindset. It's uh, and and they they cited some statistic about how you know Fortune 500 CEOs having played competitive sports at some point or other in their lives. You've probably heard that one. There are probably better stats out there now, but um, but yeah, yeah, there there definitely seems to be something there. Well, you know, it's so true. If you think about a lot of the pitfalls that can kill a culture and then subsequently kill a company, they're the same things that smart, high performance teams would avoid. Uh, You know, you have a teammate that makes a mistake on the field. You don't see the team attacking that teammate. They help them up, dust them off, you know, pat them on the back. Let's go get them. And in, uh, in the boardroom, you know, somebody misses a deal and it's a, it's a very different set of behaviors and you can alienate team members that you really need to bring in closer. So there's a, I, I believe that there's a lot of behaviors that if you can literally pull them off the court and drop them in a company, you would find instant competitiveness and much stronger cultures. Hmm. Hmm. Also, I think athletes are more resilient to begin with. You know, athletes expect to fall down. And, they're, and they are uh, trained to get back up and to do better the next time. And that type, of, um, that type of behavior, that type of resilience and tenacity is part of what makes a high performer part of a high performing culture and company. There's something else to it as well, which is that athletes tend to have a little bit of edge to them a little bit of fu um and uh i think i think that probably helps too oh i I definitely but you know and that's why i think a lot of the things that we focus on from a business school perspective is very important understanding how to uh, you know drive and grow your emotional intelligence understanding executive presence understanding behaviors within an organization all of these things are really important because it's the stuff that in a team environment happens in the locker room, happens on the bus on the way to a game, happens on the field. And you, you just got to package these things differently for a business environment. Hmm, that makes sense. How did you get teamed up with Lisa Leslie? Yeah, uh, I get that question a lot. Because uh, I guess we don't look like the most likely duo. <laughs> but um, actually, Lisa and I over the years have, have become dear friends. Our families are, are close. And um, in fact, we refer to each other as yin and yang. <laughs> I'm yin, by the way. Okay. So I've always been, a, as we've just talked, a, a big supporter and, um, and fan of sports as well as an athlete myself. Right. And the WNBA was something that I got pretty involved in, especially when Houston had a team, uh, the Comets, for many years. Yeah. 
And uh, I was part of trying to help the Comets survive when um, Alexander decided he was going to divest them from, um, from his group. And yeah. that introduced me to a lot of folks within the WNBA. So fast forward, when I was the CEO at America's SAP Users Group, I got this call from a, a pretty influential volunteer. Uh, mm -hmm. and she, uh, I'm thinking she's going to call and tell me she's real happy because we had made a lot of really impressive changes. And it was quite the opposite. She called me and said, Hey, I'm really disappointed that you haven't done more in your, you know, in your organization for women from a leadership perspective. Mm. And, uh, she was, she was right. I had focused on leadership, but I had not focused more, uh, in a more targeted way. Uh, in women's leadership, hmm. and uh, I sought to change that immediately once it was um, once it was something that we discussed. So, but I didn't want to do things like everybody else does it. You know, everybody puts together some kind of of workshop, and they get some people that have differentiated themselves to to talk about what they did. And those are great, wonderful experiences. But technology people, which was the primary audience for ASUG, they hear from technology executives all the time. And so I thought, I'm going to bring together two industries and kind of mash up um, people that have really differentiated themselves, not only in terms of technology, which is a pretty hard industry for women to differentiate themselves in, but professional sports. And so I reached out to all my connections and I put together this really cool event in Vegas. Uh, Lisa was one of four professional athletes that was, that was on the panel. Mm -hmm. And although Lisa and I had been at a couple of WNBA events before, we had not really met. Uh, after, the, after the event that we held, which huge success, uh, we all went back and did a little uh, thank you event and she and I started to connect and it was it was chemistry that was just really kind of incredible. We had a lot of similar perspectives and ideas and uh, we decided we were going to do something about it. So later I brought her on as the team captain of what we called Leadership 2.0 within ASUG and it was essentially like a leadership camp. And we traveled across the world doing workshops for, um, for leaders, both new leaders learning how to develop leadership skills and leaders that had been in the seat for a long time and needed to find a way to get past a plateau and develop and nurture some, some new skills. Uh, and so we really, we really did a lot of great things together. And uh, the book was a way to kind of memorialize and institutionalize a lot of the things that we talked about. I love that. What's really cool about her, though, before we kind of move off of, of any questions you have about Lisa, is that she is a better soul in person than celebrity. And she's a really incredible celebrity because she gives back. So mm -hmm. it's, it's really nice to see somebody that can be so real and have made so many accomplishments at the same time. It's, um, it's inspiring. I, I learn a lot from her. That's great to hear. Let's shift gears for a second. Ooh. Obviously, we're dealing with a worldwide pandemic right now. You know, everyone's everyone's aware of this. How have you seen organizations adapt to change during COVID? So it's pretty amazing the way that organizations are able to successfully deal with change during this COVID nineteen disruption. It's um, I've been working with a number of organizations before COVID, and I continue to work with them during COVID, and I'm uh, I'm amazed because. Pre-COVID, most organizations would strive to lower expenses, uh, you know, create a better culture to improve their hiring. And often that meant uh, instead of clustering around an office, you know, create an environment where they can uh, focus on a remote talent strategy. And how do you make that remote uh, talent more productive? How do you create chemistry? And, and, and I found that while some organizations were able to be successful, there were always some KPIs, especially around productivity and, uh, and revenue, that would um, sink a little, uh, you know, or, or maybe you'd have a, a little bit of a challenge in bringing everyone um, to a place where they had a, a consistent amount of productivity. It took a lot of, it took a lot of babysitting, it seemed. But on the, on the heels of COVID, <clears throat> I found that that's, that's quite different. Almost immediately, a lot of the KPIs around production start to shoot up. And 
I, th- I really think that a big part of this had to do with fear. Uh, you know, I've always believed that change is more emotional than mechanical and, mm-hmm. and people resist change. We know that two thirds of people, they don't like change as a result, 70% or more of change projects fail. So when you're, when you're trying to get people to make a massive change, getting it done successfully and being able to measure the output of successful change is, um, is a pretty big challenge. And on the other side of, or I shouldn't say on the other side, during COVID, I've been able to measure in some of these organizations successful transition to remote productivity. And I think it's because people were really worried they were going to lose their job. And so instead of seeing it more as an option, they saw it more as an opportunity to maintain and keep their job. And when there was something more in it for them, they performed at a higher level. And this this was sustained for weeks and months. And now it almost seems like a habit in many of these organizations. Hmm. So while there are some, you know, attenuation that you have to do with, uh, with a few different activities and standards, uh, for the most part, I would say change has been much more successful during COVID than pre COVID, which um, to me is unexpected. I, I would have thought that with the disruption, you would have had more resistance because people would have been, uh, you know, concerned about what was going on. They might have been distracted, and that would have been present when you looked in the in the numbers. But that that did not seem to be the case. In fact, I'm working with companies that year over year are not only growing but are coming pretty close to some of the budget numbers that they had set for themselves for this year, it's, which to me is amazing. Astonishing, yes. I think it's about cohesiveness. You know, it's, um, I have always believed that change is more emotional than mechanical. And because there's this cohesiveness, there's this shared connection to keeping the company alive. You know, everybody's got this shared mission to move the company forward and essentially save their jobs in doing so. And as you see people really coming together in this shared mission, they are hitting these productivity standards that pre-COVID were challenging to get people to hit consistently in a remote environment. And so I'm, I'm quite amazed that during a time where there's a lot of distractions, a lot of emotions, uh, a lot of question marks that you've got people just powering into their day and moving their company forward. It's funny because we talked offline about how it, we have not united as a country across political lines over this. In fact, it has served as um, a divisive force across political lines. But it sounds like within companies, people are banding together. Organizations are banding together. And, uh, and it is functioning as a force of unity. Um, why do you think that is? Well, again, I think it's a shared mission. You know, people... Yeah. And when they come together and they and they share a mission and a common goal, right. the collaboration is you know is high. The determination is high. The thus the resilience of that team is is high, and and it feeds and it's like rocket fuel for a culture. And you know this feedback that I'm giving you is anecdotal. I've not gone out and done a, a wide survey across organizations, but those organizations that I worked with before COVID and continue to work with today are um, are growing. And uh, it's, it's quite amazing. And these are not uh, companies with massive balance sheets. You know, these are Russell 2000, uh, small mid-sized businesses that one would think would be quite vulnerable in a, in a marketplace like this. And in fact, um, you know, they're looking at vulnerability in the, in the rearview mirror and hiring uh, at a pretty fast clip, picking up people from these other organizations that were thinking about survival rather than how to thrive and, uh, and, and really moving forward to continue to grow. Tell us about Factor 10 results. Sure. Um, Factor 10, let me, I guess to tell you about Factor 10, I should first give you a real quick appreciation for profitable problem solving. Yes. Uh, I wrote profitable problem solving for the grassroots of every organization. It's really dedicated to, um, to the people that run the shop floor, that run the departments, that run the, the small teams that make up the lifeblood of a company. 
Um, I believe that those are the very stakeholders that see problems when they are at their least complex, least expensive state, and it's, it's the best time to fix those problems. Um, the problem that we have is that those stakeholders don't always feel comfortable to bring those problems that they know are there and often believe that they know how to solve. They don't bring those initiatives forward for a number of different reasons. Uh, one of those reasons is that they fear that it won't look good for their career to bring something forward and not be able to explain it well or present it well in front of executive management or, you know, top management. There seems to be a, a language issue sometimes between those that run small teams and those that run the enterprise. And so I wanted profitable problem solving to be kind of a translation between those, those two important functions. Mm -hmm. And so I wrote the book more as like a conversation like what you and I are having right now. I, I had to change my whole approach, uh, my whole voice, so that it would be more of like we're sharing a cup of coffee. And I wrote the book so that you could read it on a flight from Houston to Chicago, two hours, 20 minutes, by the way. And, and it was intended to be not a lecture, but a, a handbook for change. And one of the things that I noticed when I started helping this grassroots effort to make change happen within their organization is that they didn't have a real handle on how to communicate enterprise value. And thus, they weren't getting a lot of attention for important initiatives. Because they're talking about the cost of something at a unit level or at a departmental level, the gains or the savings were relatively minuscule in that small environment. Mm -hmm. And they didn't really get the attention of you know, the, the corner office. But if they could extrapolate and run that cost or that savings across the entire organization, they might be able to bridge that, you know, that gap and get the attention of people who could see that this is really a problem that if it continued to fester could be quite costly or embarrassing for our organization. So factor 10 was just kind of a back of the envelope calculation to help people that are, you know, fantastic when it comes to business acumen, but maybe hadn't had a lot of training in math or, you know, business ratios and calculations to be able to talk about the value of money or to be able to talk about um, enterprise value. So factor 10 is kind of a, a bridge to connect those two different groups. What is echoing in my mind are, uh, is MBA case interviews, applying assumptions, that sort of thing, and using that to, to talk about what problem it feels like you're actually solving. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there was this, um, I actually got this idea uh, when I was doing some of my research and I was, I was interviewing some folks from a, a manufacturing firm and this um, particular company, they make the casings that um, radios and other electronic devices would go in. Hmm. And they had a, they had a issue from a quality assurance perspective and that the casings were, um, they, they weren't maintaining their, um, they weren't maintaining their strength. And so they were getting a, a lot of returns and it was impacting the organization. And so they crowdsourced the idea of improving the casings to the folks on the manufacturing floor. And this one guy, we'll call him Joe, realized that if he removed two washers from the design, he, for the most part, fixed the problem. And guess mm. what? He was saving money and saving time by removing these washers. The cost at his station ended up being like, you know, 25 bucks for, uh, for the course of a week. Uh, so 25 bucks isn't really going to get a lot of attention. But when you multiply that over, you know, personnel shifts, departments, and you started looking at the real enterprise value of his savings, there were a lot of zeros that Joe and his direct supervisor had left out. And so I thought, you know, if I could find an easy way to help people see that, the value of a solution is often much larger than the cost of the widget that you're pulling out of the design. Um, you know, maybe we can connect more ideas and solve more problems. Hmm. What was harder than any reasonable person would expect about writing a book? Was anything easier than you expected? Well, um, being finished is hard, you know, yeah. not, it's not as much the issue of, finishing the book it's being satisfied with the book and calling it you know kind of calling it a wrap 
Yeah, no art is ever finished, only abandoned. Is that is that the is that there the, you go. the there saying? You go. In fact, for Lisa and I, I think it was more difficult when Lisa and I wrote from the court to the boardroom. It was easier for me when it was just me, and I wrote profitable problem solving. And I okay. this time around with um, improbable outcomes, my new book, um, it's been a little easier for me. But with, when Lisa and I wrote from the court to the boardroom, two things. One, we were not satisfied with the first round. We we put a lot of heart, a lot of soul into it, and we did it uh, in kind of a iterative way, chapter by chapter. And by the time we put it all together, we we just weren't really satisfied with it. And so we literally kind of locked ourselves in a hotel suite in LA for a long weekend, and we rewrote a good portion of it, um, flipped the order of a number of things, and uh, and we felt much better. By the time we had, you know, had that extra time to to really polish and reorganize, but I think the most difficult thing that we encountered it wasn't just the reorganization of content and and rewriting. It was the challenge of writing in first person when there's two people. Uh, ah. Yeah, we well, you know, I I, I mentioned earlier that we've kind of got this yin yang thing going, and so we thought, what a cool subtle way to illustrate our cohesiveness, you know, to write in first person. So we had this idea that we would share a voice and, and share our perspectives on these important concepts. And we would tell a story in every chapter. And the hope was because Lisa is not only an accomplished athlete, but an accomplished entrepreneur and businesswoman as well, that you might not know who was talking when we were sharing our stories. Although I have to say it is easy to tell it's not me dunking the basketball in the Olympics. But uh, I, see, I, I don't know about that. <laughs> I know you wouldn't have known that, right? You, uh, but um, outside of, of maybe that story, the rest of them were intended to be, uh, you know, one voice, one idea, one set of beliefs. And that was, that was challenging because even though we share a lot of ideas, we express ourselves differently. And so we had to, you know, we had to bridge that. We actually got the idea to write in first person from a, it was a best time seller, you know, uh, some years ago called Flight of the Buffalo. And the, the, you know, like most books, there's something that you get out of it that kind of sticks with you. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I remember from this book, aside from the fact that the authors wrote in first person, um, is that they, they really focused on how leadership should work themselves out of a job. And, uh, and I, I, liked, I liked some of the concepts that they addressed, especially at that point in, in my career. And so when Lisa and I decided to do this, for some reason, the fact that those two authors wrote in first person came back to me and I threw it out and she said, yeah, let's do that. So um, that's, that's how we decided to, to move forward. You began your career in leadership by enlisting in the U.S. Army Reserves and later the Texas Army National Guard. What do you think are the most important lessons learned from military service that cannot be learned anywhere else, including maybe most, uh, maybe most notably for this conversation, sports? Where do those things separate? Where do those groups uh, separate? This was one of the easiest questions that I saw because it comes to mind so quickly duty, um, humility, mm. uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of lessons. I, I, I can't even count them all that you learn, especially I, I didn't go in as an officer. I enlisted. I was a kid trying to figure out how to pay for college. Right. And, you know, I, I went into the military for the GI bill and I came out with so much more than that. I, I learned not to judge people, um, based on a short set of facts or, you know, um, sizing people up too quickly because I learned that people have a lot of strength inside that maybe I had just not learned how to, to see or measure. And therefore I learned how to rely on members of a team, uh, in a faster, better, more responsive way. I became a better team member. I became a better leader. Um, I think I just became a more reliable person. It's um, the discipline and the structure is uh, incredible. It's um, it's an experience that I wish for everyone. To be quite honest, it's it's um, it's the type of thing that you. I personally wouldn't want to go back and do it again, <laughs> but I'm 
I wouldn't change it. It's, uh, it, it's one of the best decisions that I've, uh, that I've ever made. And I'll, I'll tell you, it's interesting too, because when I, when I joined the reserves, I joined the chemical corps. And so much of what, much of what I learned to do, decontaminate personnel, um, equipment, uh, it's, it's not so different than what's happening in our civilian world right now with this whole COVID issue. So it's, it's, uh, it's amazing to me that anything from my military background could um, have a life in my civilian world. But, uh, but clearly, to, to be really responsive to your question, the connection with sports is the connection to teams. You know, you, you get a group of high-performing people, they're given a mission, and they figure out how to accomplish the mission. And everybody knows what everybody's job is. On the court, you know, I know what my role is, I know what your role is, and that's how we depend on each other, and we, we support each other to get the point. Uh, you know, when you're in a military environment, you know what everybody's skill is, you know what everybody's job is, and we protect each other by doing our jobs really well and then by watching out for other people. Those are impeccable team skills that, that every high-performing team has to learn how to have or any gains that they have will be very short-term. The vision at Mays is to create Mays transformational leaders. You often speak on the topic of transformational leadership. What is 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 there an aha moment that people often have when you speak on this topic? Oh, I think so. I think when I explain to people that change is far more emotional than mechanical, um, hmm. one maybe is some cynicism or some some doubt. Um, but I think once we get into the concept of change and we start focusing on what usually throws off that 70% of projects that fail, you're dealing with, you know, change resistance, you're dealing with uh, a number of emotional factors that impact the way that people uh, either participate or what forms their inattention to the results for change. It's, um, you know, it's, it's a big emotional challenge and you've you know you've got to meet it head on as a strong leader that can create trust and so in a way when you're when you're dealing with change you're you're dealing with leadership and those two things go go hand in hand is there any difference between how executives and professionals process what you're saying and how students process it the reason that i ask is because students and and more broadly younger people seem to often be more comfortable with change uh their you know their habits are less established that sort of thing so what are their takeaways any different well i think their understanding and their hope for strong culture is very strong mm -hmm. and because the the probability of successful change is embedded in a strong culture. I think they gravitate to that. And so they immediately see the way a strong leader can impact a strong culture and how a strong culture can, found, can form the bedrock for successful change. Mm. So I think that seems to make sense. The challenge that executives have is that they're often having those aha moments in an environment that's already created. So they're, they're living with the hand that they've either been dealt or that, uh, that they created themselves. If they have a culture that doesn't form strong values and doesn't, uh, doesn't reinforce the right behaviors, people are not going to do well in a change environment. So oftentimes I find myself telling executives that are dealing with failed change that you're really dealing with a cultural issue, mm -hmm. not a project issue which is hard for them to believe because often leadership is more satisfied with culture than the stakeholders that, you know, that make up the company. Hmm. During your tenure at America's SAP user group, you led a transformation that took the 20 year brand from a period of financial and operational trouble to one of prosperity and stability. What was the key driving factor for your success in this role that wouldn't be immediately obvious, even to an educated observer? i tell you what, that was a really challenging endeavor. Uh, and it's because trust and relevance 
were um, out the window. I mean, the, if you walked in and you're doing your first assessment of ASUG, the first thing most people are going to see is that, you know, they're bleeding from a financial perspective. They're, they're, you know, digging into the very last bit of financial reserves to pay for payroll. Mm. Uh, the organization, we're checking it for a pulse, right? We're trying to figure out if this thing's going to survive. And w- what I found was truly missing was the the substance that you could reattach to so we had to really focus on trust within core stakeholders and we had to focus on the relevance of the organization because those things had eroded over time the challenge for a change agent or a turnaround um, specialist is that many people had years and years to erode the organization and you're under the microscope for 100 to you know 180 days to try to create some type of tangible improvement so what was very difficult about the ASUG turnaround was getting people to trust me. They had heard a lot of um, speeches from the board, from leadership, from very well-intended people that cared about the organization, but right. didn't look at change as a system. And they didn't really look at the entire scope of what needed to be done. And so they weren't communicating something that they would follow through with. And once we were able to establish trust and relevancy, the mechanics of the turnaround were a lot easier to, uh, to manage. And our implementation of our plan became easier. Don't get me wrong. It was hard. We had a lot of two steps forward, three steps back, but we were going in the right direction and we did the right things in that we communicated, communicated, communicated. I showed them that I cared as often as I could in as many ways and channels as possible. And we, we reinforced our wins at every milestone that we could imagine. Even if it was a silly small win, we had a way to celebrate the fact that we were moving forward. All of those things helped to move our momentum forward. And pretty soon the milestones were not small, they were larger. We were starting to see increase in membership. We were starting to see increase in revenues. We were starting to see improvement in the way that our clients were using our content and our services to improve their use of enterprise software. And uh, pretty soon, it was, it was a pretty cool story. Uh, we actually won company of the year from the American Business Association for the turnaround and, and some other accolades that I'm real proud of. It was, um, it was a very hard job, but it was one that I cherish because the team that I assembled, uh, by the way, a couple of Aggies on that team. Um, in fact, I hired one person from my EMBA class and she essentially became our CFO and, and helped us to move forward. But it, it, was, um, it was just a, a fairy tale in a lot of ways of the things that could persevere and go, and, and go in your favor. And uh, we had a great outcome as a result of that. Wonderful. Let's move to let's move to some rapid fire. Let's do it. First, what very important truth do few people agree with you on? Oh, the contrarian question. Yes. All right. Um, I believe change is a mindset, and I think most people think that it's a skill set. And so, until we get to a point that we look at change as a mindset. I think that we are going to continue to look at rates of failure that are untenable and we're getting better. We're starting to see change being addressed in the, in the way that you might think about addressing it as a mindset, but I don't think we're really there yet. When it comes to thinking of change as a mindset, is there a way you can capture in a sentence or two what that mindset is? Yeah, it's responsibility, it's, um, it's resilience, it's openness, it's, it's being agile. There's, but it's not just the responsibility of the leader. It's the responsibility of everyone. And that's why it needs to be a mindset. We're teaching change leaders how to lead during times of uncertainty, and that's helping. The problem is that the change leaders aren't the ones resistant to change. It's the, it's the rest of the team. Hmm. So you've got to create a mindset that permeates your entire culture. And when you've got more people open to change and open to trusting leadership to take them through that change, you'll be more successful with it. If you keep treating it like a skill set and you look at it simply from its programmatic perspective, you'll improve the outcome if you didn't, you know, compared to a change that went in a non-systematic way, but it's still not going to leave you with the type of track record that you're going to want. Okay. What is your fondest memory of Texas a 
You know, I have a lot of them, but I'd have to say the way that we responded to Hurricane Ike. Uh, I was finishing my, uh, my EMBA program at that time. And I remember waking up in the morning and looking at all these trees down in my backyard. And what was really cool is that my backyard wasn't what I focused on first. I got in a car with a bunch of other classmates and we took turns. We went to, you know, one student's house, another student, another student, and we made a couple days out of taking care of each other. I, I still have so much pride in the way that we got together as a team instead of just focusing on what was in our own backyard. That makes me really proud. That tradition definitely continues. What do you think is people's biggest misconception of you? Uh, I think people think I like to visit. And I, I not only am not good at it, but uh, I am working at it. But, you know, people love to kind of sit and visit. And I've never been very good at that. Hmm. And uh, I'm working on it because I know that it's an important way to build a relationship. But sometimes my inner monologue is done. Um, my dear friends know this about me. You know, I, we catch up and uh, even though time has passed, like nothing's ever passed, mm. but I'm probably not one of those people that is constantly keeping in touch and, and calling. And so, um, I'm working on that, but I think sometimes, especially growing up in Texas, people think, you know, we're just going to catch up and visit and uh, I'm, I need to be better at that. I, I, I'm not as good at it as I should be. So does your mind want to immediately go to let's do something productive together or does it go to, or, or are you just, do you just not make the reconnection or the connection in the first place? What is your mind doing instead of visiting? Yeah. I, I want to know what, you know, if it's something that's productive or if it's something that's fascinating, you know, I can stay plugged into that. But if we get off track to something that, um, I don't know. That just doesn't seem to, if, if it doesn't keep my attention, I have a hard time staying plugged in and I, it, I need to work on that. If it doesn't challenge your mind enough, perhaps. Sure. I, I, I think it's just a matter of, um, you know, my dad told me that he thinks maybe they adopted me from New York and they just <laughs> didn't know it. Um, I say that with a lot of friends that are New Yorkers. So I say that with love, but you know, there's just a, there's that saying, be bright, be gone, you know, and I, I kind of like to have impactful, strong interactions, but I don't always love it when they linger. And so I think sometimes that's not something that, um, that's something I, I'm working on, but I don't think people always know that about me. And so yeah. I constantly find myself in those conversations, which gives me a lot of opportunity to learn how to be better at it. I like that. What was your most valuable failure? All of them. Uh, I mean, I'm an entrepreneur, so you swing and miss most of the time, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, think, I think I'm just really pleased for all of the failures that I've had, the big and the small ones, and really thankful that I'm open to learning from them. Hmm. Anyone you would like to send good bull? Oh, definitely. In fact, this was kind of hard to pick because so many people at A&M are so incredible, right? But I have to tell you, I had this um, student, she just graduated last semester um, mm. from a and Mallory Gale. She, um, she is a social entrepreneur. She launched a, an organization called Interwoven. Interwoven is all about creating a sustainable supply chain. She works with artisans from Ethiopia to make cool jewelry and create a living wage for these people. Uh, I also worked with her outside of my entrepreneurial perspectives class and a self-directed class, and we focused on entrepreneurship. And I recently heard that she won a launch pad uh, grant and is continuing to expand her business. And I just, she's inspiring. And I just want to tell her, you know, keep doing it. And uh, I'm real proud of her. Good bull for sure. Dr. Chambers, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate you joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. I've really enjoyed this. We hope you enjoyed that episode for our Mastercast top three takeaways. I first wanted to talk about a common theme through a lot of Bridget's discussion, which was a shared mission. She talked about it in the context of sports. She talked about it in the context of turnarounds. 
And she talked about it again in the context of working in this COVID environment and just how important that shared mission was. And in the COVID environment specifically, it seemed really interesting to me that she's seeing organizations thrive. And I know there are many organizations hurting, but specifically the organizations that she's working with that are thriving with having a common goal, but I think also having a common enemy. So the challenges that we're facing right now, and I can speak to this in higher education, but the challenges that companies might be facing right now are not necessarily caused by a person, right? They're caused by a virus. And so we're having to rise to the occasion or embrace change in a way that we might, before there would have been a person, a CEO we could have pushed back against and been annoyed with. But in this case, I'm casting the movie in my head right now. Yeah, do it. Do it. Let's let's go there. Who's playing the lead? Well, it's 2020. So we need a we need a female lead. And I'm thinking Gina Davis is my favorite female lead. I don't know what role you're trying to cast right now, but I'm just saying she could probably play it. I think Gina Davis would be like the mentor. Okay. At this point. I mean, but that's she's like the Obi Wan Kenobi. But she's like she talks about how women <laughs> over forty don't get cast well in Hollywood. So I think you might have just typecasted her into that old lady role, and she could play. She doesn't age. have to be old. I don't know. I I kind of see like an Emma Watson or something. Mm, she's good. Who's the villain? I kind of want a female villain too. Old or young? Honestly, young. Because usually villains are cast older too. Let's go. Let's go young, like young visionary CEO who turns out to not be quite what she seems. Emma Stone. We've got the Emmas. The War of the Emmas. I like that. I kind of also want to cast Anne Hathaway as a villain, just because she's yeah. like the princess all the time. But I think she could do it. She'd be a good villain. No question. Anne Hathaway can do anything on screen and can irritate anyone off screen. Is she, she irritating very, off screen? She has a very difficult reputation. Really? Very, e- extremely talented, but incredibly difficult. By reputation, I have not worked with her. I did not know this. Good to know, Benjamin. Yes. Hmm. Okay, well, now that we went on that little tangent, this common goal aspect, I could definitely can see it in higher education with having to move online so quickly and then now working together to try to offer in-person and online classes and really being incredibly efficient, working remotely, offering courses remotely, things that we didn't think we really could do well, uh, that we're doing well now, which has been really interesting to see. I I hope that it's a success. You know, it's I, I think that clearly a lot of thought and effort has gone into making this work. And I'm proud of the university for what it's doing to try and make things safe. And I I hope that it works. Are you seeing anything from a corporate perspective that shows that? I mean, I, we don't work in a corporate environment, either one of us right now. But, you know, I definitely have seen employers of our students or friends, companies really doing well from a management perspective. Again, not every company is doing well from a financial perspective because customers are very different right now. But Mm -hmm. I think from a being able to operate remotely, it's been quite impressive what companies have done too. Yes, I agree. Everything that I'm hearing is just that it's been great. It's been great on the corporate front. You know, we we touched on this in the show. The the place where people do not seem to be uniting is across political lines, mm-hmm. and that's tough. It's sort of a. Uh, I think one of the places that we have that we continue to kind of fail as a nation is the the increasing bipartisanism of things. And I, you know, maybe that was an inevitable result of our. The, the formation of our political system and the way that we kind of put things together. But other countries don't seem to deal with quite as much of this. And maybe it's always easier from the outside looking in. Maybe it's the same in every country, but I have a really hard time with that. It seems to be like the the big dark mark on, you know, on everything that's happening right now. Yeah. And I don't know what to do with that. I agree. I think it will be interesting to see on all fronts from an education perspective, and I mean K through 12 and higher ed, from a political perspective, from a corporate perspective, how much change that we've experienced right now will stay for Mm -hmm. a long period of time and how much will 
go back to what we would call normal, right? The way things were before COVID. I think that will right. be really interesting to see, even you know, the, the politics aspect of it. And obviously, we're close to an election and that heightens things as well. So, you know, we're seeing a few things working together at the same time. I don't know, it'll be really interesting to see whatever normal looks like. I, you know, I don't, I don't have a crystal ball to predict what's going to happen with the virus. I tend to think that at some point we're going to go back to closer to normal. But what that you know really looks like, how much of the change ends up being lasting. I remember early on people were saying that like, this is really going to change the way that we work. This is really going to change the way that we whatever. And I was like, I don't know about that. I think we're going to go back to normal in June. And now that this has lasted so long, I do think that there will be some lasting change. I like change. I'm ready for this to change. <laughs> yeah, but. no question. I like I like change too, but yeah, I'm ready for us to move on to the next change, perhaps. <laughs> so speaking of which, for our second takeaway, I didn't mean to transition so perfectly. I'm pleased with myself. Um, for our second takeaway, I did want to talk about change. I thought it was really interesting that Bridget talked about change being a mindset versus a skill set. I just wanted to see if you had any thoughts on that comment. To me, what I what I got from the explanation that she gave for that was that once she said what she meant by it, it sounded like the issue that you run into with change is that it sort of is pushed into the organization from the top and the organization needs to be continually and always prepped for whatever change is coming next. It changes. It's not a sometime thing. It's an all the time thing. Mm -hmm. And your organization needs to be comfortable with that from bottom to top. Mm. That was kind of my interpretation of what she ended up saying. Yeah, I think that makes sense. That that change is the constant almost. Right. And and all of your organization has to be ready to roll with that. That it has to be part of your culture. It has to be one of your core values, really. And I think especially probably any organization, but certainly the ones that she works with that are going through turnarounds that are really going through major, major changes, not just small shifts, but really significant, dramatic changes. Right. For our last takeaway, we've talked about this before on the show, but I think it's so interesting. The relationship of organized sports and business, and certainly she capitalized on that in her book, From the Court to the Boardroom, which how cool is that, that she has a picture with Magic Johnson and Lisa Leslie? I'm kind of jealous, but um, we'll post that on social media. But the relationship between organized sports and business is so strong. I shared this before, and I cannot find this study, and I would love to, but PwC conducted a study probably 20 years ago now where they were looking for what factors correlated with success at the firm. And the only right. factor they could find was participation in a team sport. And I yep. think in part because it is so similar to business, business is a team sport in a lot of in a lot of ways. Again, a common goal, a common enemy, a common purpose and mission with tension and dusting each other off and picking each other back up. All of those things are present in both organized sports and business. Especially when your CEO is Emma Stone, the yeah. evil. <laughs> Poor Emma I'm Stone. To, yeah, I'm writing the movie in my head right now. It's good. I'm sure that there are other activities, especially kids can engage in that can prepare them well. I think probably like chess or something like that. Like there's other things that kids can do that would prepare them all for business. But that team sport aspect may be one of the best things. Well, I wonder how much team sport participation, like at what point do you hit diminishing returns with that? For example, is a professional athlete, does do they have an advantage over a college athlete? Does a college athlete have an advantage over a high school athlete? And is Little League enough? I think Little League is probably enough I mean, because it's mm. not you at some point you become so specialized, right? And And almost maybe hyper competitive or hyper training in a way that could maybe even, like you said, diminish the return of participation in a team sport. Right. And the other thing is with especially professional sports, you're now sorting into such a small population right. that, you know, finding finding the other unique elements of that recipe that make for really successful executives, you're pulling from a smaller pool. Yeah. I certainly think college athletes have an edge. But what I've seen from college athletes is it's less about 
they're getting the same benefit from team sports that someone might get from playing Little League. But what they're getting that other students aren't is just having to balance so many commitments on their time and energy. And and I think that's what I see. And I've told this story before, but I had Ross Stripling in class and he, last I heard, was pitching for the LA Dodgers. And I remember it was an eight o'clock class and every day I would, every Monday, Wednesday, Friday or whatever day it was, I would walk up and Ross would be asleep in the hallway outside of class. He was always the first one there and he was just asleep laying in the hallway. And I was like, all right. And, and he, and every time he came into class on time, but you know, he had come from the gym where he had been training that morning and just the demands on his time. I think it's pretty similar with being in the core too. I mean, again, there's some differences, but that demand on time, that discipline and regimen and showing up every day, whether you're at your best or not, those things I think are skills that are good to look for in an employee and are good to look for opportunities that will build those. And sports is a natural place to do that. I think some people actually thrive in not in the chaos, but in the busyness of that. Mm -hmm. My guess is you're probably that way. You're I'm a little that bit way. that way. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm definitely that way. And in college, I you know played football in the fall and ran track in the spring. And the reaction that I frequently got to that was, when do you have time to do anything? And it was like, I don't want time to do other stuff. I like my life like this. I like to be, you know, driving and and pushing toward things. That's just what I enjoy. Yeah, and I think sometimes people who like to be busy, the more time you have, the less. <laughs> the less you thrive. So, you know, it is right. sometimes I, I think for better or worse, I'm often at my best when I'm busier. And so not being that way doesn't doesn't make my life better. Yeah. And I never got to go on like a crazy spring break trip, but yeah. that wasn't what really mattered to me. And, right. you know, I've I've gotten I've grown to appreciate travel more as I've gotten a little older. But but you really hate traveling and you really hate being outside. <laughs> I don't hate traveling. I like going to uh I like going to cities. I like museums. I got that from my mom. I like understanding, you know, different cultures. We Maddie and I took a trip to Spain a couple of years ago and I really cool. I loved that. Yeah. Um but yeah, the outdoors not my thing. <laughs> I'll do it, but only for other people. If it's if I'm on my own, I will never be outside. That's so selfless of you. Yes. Yes, I'm happy to make that sacrifice for you and the other people I care about, Shannon. <laughs> Would you close us with a quote, Ben? I would love to close us with a quote. It'll be the one thing that I add to today's conversation. <laughs> Inspired by our previous guest, Damon Dimoir, entrepreneurship is the one place in my life where I have to always remember that if everything is in equilibrium, I'm probably losing. I have to embrace the deep discomfort. Wow. Love that. Thank you. Thank you. An MBA from Texas A&M University can take your career to a whole new level. With full-time and weekend options, Texas A&M suits your schedule. So get a better gig. Visit mba.tamu.edu. Looking to start a podcast? Trying to tackle questions like, how do I record? How do I edit? How can I get music for my show? What equipment do I need? How do I distribute it? Good news. The podcast architects are here to help. Whether that's from start to finish fixing the audio quality, helping you get the episodes posted, go to podconsulting.co. Everyone has something worth sharing with the world.